Perhaps it's because I had a baby, or maybe it's because I'm, I'm leaving somewhat soon. I've been reflecting more on this idea of unity. Unity. I think it's easy with a family member to have this sense of unity because, you know, where do you end and they begin, especially with the baby, right? They can't live without you. They can't live without someone taking care of you. But again, again, Christ returns to this theme in Scripture we've, we've heard it talked about many times here from the Church of Good Shepherd. And here specifically, towards the uh, end of John, as we head towards the crucifixion, we hear him talking about he and me, me and us. I hope they are in us as I am in you, Father, as you are in me. And he said this a few different ways throughout the scripture, so it's understandable to get a little twisted. But here he's praying to God and saying, I hope they're in us so that they may know that I was sent from the Father to you. This idea of being in God is, is kind of an amazing one. When you think about it, this call to know, to, to be in unity with the Creator, with divinity, what, is it, what does it mean? You think about it one way, aren't we already one with God? If God is all form and function, as Sweetford says, God is in all things and all things are made of God, aren't we already one with God? Why, why would He task us and then pray later? about us being in God, in God, as God is in us, as He is in us. Well, I think it's multifold uh, the answer, you may have your own idea. But for me, the core uh, response to that question seems to be that, yes, we're in God, but are we of God? Are we really finding the peace, finding the joy that is our birthright? That is our nature. Are we, are we finding ourselves amidst the turmoil of life, the worries, the anxiety, the pain? Are we finding that naturalness of life, of the spirit? And that's a question we can just ask ourselves. Do I feel always peace and joy? Maybe always is asking too much. But do I feel this unity? Do I still maybe get defensive and judgmental? Do I beat myself up? Do I linger in the past about the way, the way things could have been and so on and so forth? I think we all do some of this. I, I uh, celebrate those who don't have to do any of that. And indeed, if you don't, please share your wisdom with us because for a lot of us, on planet Earth today, we carry a certain anxiety about the future as well. Fear of death, fear of all kinds of things happening. We see what's happening in other countries and we know we're just steps away, especially now with social media being what it is, we can watch as much of war-torn countries as we want, almost. In fact, in the West, we're more sanitized than most other countries. They see a lot more of it than we do. But we can still find it. But so I think it's an interesting prayer. It's one of hope, of, of a true love of people that we hear from Christ. This prayer that we find ourselves in God as God is in us. God is in us, he says. But are we fully in God? Are we fully in God? I can't help but connect this to another parable he tells of the, uh, the vines and the branches. I am the vine and you are the branches. And without the vine, you can't survive. If you are a branch that falls off, you wither. You wither. And the more I think we separate ourselves, and maybe it's a natural thing, we picked it up from an early age, the more we feel separate from other people, the harder our edges of where I am and where the next person begins, the more anxiety we feel the more separate pain we feel, the more judgment we can't help but kind of unleash at ourselves and others because we're defending ourselves. We're defending ourselves, not ourselves, but ourselves, the little self. And noting just that that's the way we sometimes think is a big part of overcoming 
There's a reason why the Lord always pointed us back to these key truths again and again. He said, turn around, repent. So it's meaning turn around. Turn away from your false idea of what you are. Just turn around and look within. Because the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Is your very life. Your very life. And so on a day where we celebrate communion and celebrate our union, our co-communion together, I think it's right to reflect on what it means to be unified. And I don't think it means we let down every single defense. It doesn't mean we let someone into our home who's not uh, you know, safe to be around. It doesn't mean we just trust everyone really know. Doesn't mean, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Doesn't mean that we have to let go of our defenses necessarily entirely. But I do think it calls on us to let go of that sense of separation and come to see that how could I be without God, without the universe? The universe wasn't here as a whole, could I be here with it? There's a reason we call it the union verse, the union verse. One. And often in religious circles, and thankfully not much of this church, but maybe we get into this modality in our own way, often we have this idea of God and God is one, and we think that means that everyone else is wrong. It's kind of a funny way to approach things, right? Yeah. God is one, and God started perhaps these certain religions that have branched off from each other. Why do we feel the need to say, well, that your God is wrong? You went the wrong path thousands of years ago. Now you're all condemned to what? Hell? I know I'm preaching to the choir here. <laughs> but it's kind of crazy, right? And I think it sets us up for the feeling of hell. The dimming of hell sets us up to be in our own hell. We all know what it's like in those darkest of days where we feel the most separate and the most sad. We really have little control over that. Funny enough. You know, I preach up here like we have a lot of control over these things, but a lot of it just comes up. Comes up. But the fact that you're here reflecting on these things, the fact that you're in community, you're drawn to a community that has made it their legacy in this town to be open to so many people of so many different faiths, not needing for you to convert to come up for communion, to, to be a part of the community, to talk with each other. No, none of that. Conversion therapy or anything is necessary here because we know God meets you where you're at. In fact, God's already shining in you. Already shining in you. But as our minds realize, oh, I'm, I am kind of mechanical in my reaction to judgment, you start to gain some distance between the mechanical aspect of life and start to see your peace, what you truly are, you are not. You start to drop the facade, the defense mechanisms, and you start to see that we're in this together. We're in this together. Whatever comes next, we're probably in that together as well. How could it be disconnected from this one? And one of the most beautiful things in Emmanuel Swedenborg's writings for me is this vision. These visions he had of heaven, of all these people of different communities, from different earths, all joining in worship, community making, work, building, growing together in all different ways. Each community has a different kind of bent to it. Some people like to travel between the communities. Some help manage what Swedenborg calls the house, which is a our own making. And indeed, the hells for Swedenborg are another beautiful aspect because he just says, essentially, we're in hell to the extent we think we love hell. We know those people, right, who can't help but start a dog fight. Maybe that's not their spirit, but let's say it is. Those people who fight, no matter what's coming who use their knowledge to control and 
You get it. In fact, I know I can be like that sometimes. And I think a lot of us can. We can have these feelings of judgment, of need to control, because what if we don't control? I'm in the right position to control, and I should control. But if this doesn't happen, well, then tradition's lost, and we're out of luck. That's what brings people back. Yet we know in this church that the church is seeing a new day. We have to be open to new ideas. Our lives became better as our children introduced new things to us and our grandchildren and things that we weren't necessarily comfortable with before. And we, as we came to accept them, we started noting that maybe our old barriers and our old sense of what has to happen weren't exactly right. And I think we find a new fluidity to life, a new peace, a new love. Our minds have trouble with this message sometimes because they have to be right. What is our mind when we talk about this? Right? It's the thoughts, it's the judgmental or analytical, whatever it is, have habitual thoughts. And often we identify so much with this idea of ourselves, we miss our true nature, our true self. And so as we reflect on what it means to be in God, I think it's an enabling impulse. One that helps us to see that our minds aren't always in God. Is God really thinking the way I think? Really? He says the way we think isn't like how he thinks according to scripture. How should we? No, often that's the part of us that's branching too far out, winding around in life and trying to control and become stilted. What happens when a vine wraps around things so tight that it covers itself? Well, it loses the life, loses the connection to life, to water. It becomes disconnected from the vine. It becomes disconnected. And so, as we head towards the end of Lent, reflecting on what it really means to repent, I think is important. 40 days in the wilderness, 40 days of temptation, we all have this in our lives. We all have a sense of separateness, of I don't like what's going on. Some of us have that every single moment. We never have. Our minds have. But as we come to see that that's how the mind works, we maybe return closer to the source. We say, oh, I'm going to take a few steps back from you, just for a moment here. Maybe closer to being in God as God is in us. And so as we look for love and as we look for joy, I don't think we have far to go. So let's take a few moments Open our hearts, open our minds. We don't need to build these things within ourselves, but let them unfurl. Let go of the things holding them down, the cinder block that the earth has taught us to think like. As Christ said, they are not here for this earth. They're not part of this earth. They don't belong on this earth in this earth. Mysterious saying. So allowing those things to cling away and noticing the peace of our spirit, the vibration of love that's inherent to our bodies. Taking a few deep breaths. Noting that the thing, the judgments that think, 
some things needed to get ahead are the very things keeping us behind. And as we go through all these things, notice your spirit, your light coming out of whatever your wilderness has been, whether you know God or Christ, coming out of whatever limitations that are holding your love down, your joy. Noting that you're coming to a new morning of your true self, of your inner nature, nature that's been with you since the beginning. That childlikeness, that peace, that is unbothered by the things of this world, because it's spirit, it's life, it's love. Thank you. 